right, Keith. I hope you're doing well with all this craziness, and it's fun to see your work here. So let's talk. All right, so it's some really fun stuff here. I love the energy going around, and we've got the uh, this and this going on, and this plays against it. There's a lot of good stuff going on there. And there's some really beautiful colors happening. So the thing I would suggest, and it's only a suggestion, of course, um, is I'd, I'd uh, make a decision on the shadow shapes or the lack of shadow shapes. So when we look at, uh, let me just uh, switch tools here. Size here. Capacity here. When we look at all this area in here, this is a little better, and I'll talk about that. But when we look at those, we're not sure exactly where the light is and exactly where the shadow is. Now, sometimes we have a very good, we can make a very good education, educated guess. Other times, and this, what this little line here I'm putting is not suggesting you made the form look like that, but in this area and a lot of the other areas, you're not so sure. And even in this area where we are quite sure, we want to have an, a, a kick to it. We want to have a, a little accent there. I call it anchoring the form. So what we want to do then is be very clear on where the shadow shapes are, if there are shadow shapes. I'll explain that in a second. And we want to then anchor those shapes. And I'll show you how to do that. So let's look at that. This is a Serov, S-E-R-O-V. And notice in the Serov here, this is north light. We have light coming through the uh, through a window, presumably. You can see it coming through here, lightning. And that window is quite far away because the light's uh, so soft. And so we'll notice that we can get really black areas, really dark areas, <clears throat> but we can't, uh, we don't see really strong shapes. We don't see a shape or shadow here really strongly. It's very, very subtle. And so the difference between the light side and the shadow side is, is also very subtle. There is a difference between the darker areas, in this case, where the forms turn to the left and where they turn down, it gets darker left. Uh, but they're incredibly subtle. That's typical of a cloudy day of uh, north light, North light uh, windows or skylights in an artist studio, uh, fluorescent lights in office building, that kind of thing. A misty day. Um, all right. Uh, so, and then here's another one. Also by Cyril. And you can see this is even uh, more subtle. You still get. What's going on here? Why can't I get that? There we go. There we go. You can see, you still get that sense of when things go down, the the forms catch less light, and that idea of a different value, no matter how subtle it is, suggests a different plane, and that gives us that what I call that box logic, if you're familiar with. But they're very very subtle. And if you looked at some others, this is close to a Gustav Klimt, for example. If you look at uh, others, uh, other artists, you can see it even more graphic. Manet, as opposed to Monet, Manet, his work very, very subtle, oftentimes, usually. So that's that's a quality of North Light. And so you're basically, in effect, saying no shadows. We're not going to create real strong shadow shapes. There might not even be any sense 
of how the form turns down on this hand. Yeah, this is, has a structure like this, <clears throat> and the structure that moves from top down, facing up, facing forward, facing under, there you can see some subtle value change. So the uh, forms that go from left to front to right, or I'm sorry, from right to front to left, we don't see really any value change. So oftentimes the, the structure flattens out. Uh, and that's a fine way to work, give you a certain look. It's uh, beautiful as we can see here. Subtle, it's very flattering to your subject matter. But it's also in some ways harder to paint, harder to render because you've got really subtle differences between the lightest things and the darkest things. The chiaroscuro uh, rendering in light and shadow, Rembrandt, this is Franz Hall over here, this is Rembrandt over here. Um, that's a different uh, animal altogether. And there you have very dramatic light. It's also usually north light, but you, you put them very close to the light source. Uh, or go out on you know, impressionist work, go out on a sunny day, or Sargent's paintings outside. You have this direct light, uh, sunlight, direct uh, light, in uh, a model light in the studio maybe, and you get a very strong sense of light and shadow. That's high Renaissance, Baroque, Rococo, all the way up through the neoclassical, the Romantic periods, Impressionism, and then post-Impressionism post-impressionism starts breaking down again. North light or direct light. So you're either lighting it by the blue sky, or you're lighting it by sunshine. You're lighting it by fluorescent lights or you're uh, lighting it by some kind of incandescent light. There, no matter how subtle the rendering is, you get a very strong sense of the light shapes and the shadow shapes and sometimes it gets rather subtle but you'll still see almost everywhere sometimes there'll be a little leak here and there but almost everywhere you'll see exactly where light and shadow meet sometimes it can be a little ambiguous but the more ambiguity you put in the less structure you have the less sense of volume and form so the chiaroscuro style gives you great box logic, great structure. So right in here, we start to wonder, is that a dark half tone or is it a light shadow? That affects things a little bit and makes it a little more ambiguous in the cheek structure and in, in all of the lower face structure, no doubt at all. You know exactly what's in light on the ear, that exactly what's in shadow, that forehead a little ambiguous. But once you've done good work everywhere else, you can get a little uh, little ambiguities uh, mixed in there and be just fine. So that is uh, uh, that direct light and shadow pattern. You have a shape of light, you have a shape of shadow, and the two do not compete. That gives you that boxy structure, and everything is be going to be consistent. Every time, in this case, you turn to the right, your forms get darker. Every time you, the form turns down, it gets darker. It's turning away from the light source. Dramatic. Even in this soft and fuzzy Rembrandt, you get a clear sense of where the uh, light and shadow is. Look at that lower lip covered in, in beard. You get a very clear architectural idea. Stepping down. Stepping down. It may be incredibly soft, the transition from light to shadow, but you have little or no doubt exactly where the shadow begins. And it's because it stays pretty graphic, pretty strong value change, or And or there's a the the artist accents the the forms 
anchors them. So notice up in this Franz Hall in that forehead area that I said is a little bit ambiguous. So you definite light over here, definite shadow over here. Here we're not quite so sure. But look what he did. I don't know how I did that. That was pretty interesting. I scared myself there. But look at right here, that little anchor. It's a moment in the value scape. Just imagine that's gone, in fact. Uh, so let's take that out. You still have a sense of where that turns. It's basically a corner plane. It is a corner plane. So, um, there we go. Front plane, corner plane, side plane. But when we put back in that little accent, it makes it much clearer. We absolutely know where it's turning, these boxy facets, like so. That's super helpful. Not only that, when you give that little accent there, you're making it seem organic. It's not just a a mechanical transition of lighter to ever darker values. It has a uh, some kind of notice even this one here, there's an area where it speeds up. So there's an implied somewhere here is a corner where we go from front to side or whatever it is. It's not near as clear as that, but it's still uh, clear. And that's what we would have if we took out that little accent. By putting in the accent, we still get this gradation, but we get a quickening, a little bump in the gradation, a spike, and that gives us a much clearer, still not quite as clear as a strong corner, but it gives us a quite precise feeling of where the front meets the side. So it's going to have good structure because we're going to make all this stuff over here a different value than all this stuff over here and we're going to get rather precise not perfectly precise it's organic so it's a little, life's a little messy but quite precise in where that change takes place and then the gradation will soften that uh, even more and sometimes a whole lot more but we'll still have that little anchoring notice he does it down in here too at the neck so right before we jump off of the neck and onto his crazy collar, or jump off of the neck and back up onto the digastric plane, the underside of the jaw and uh, chin, uh, it gets a little darker. He does it here too with the sideburn area. As this drops down, it darkens before it bumps back into the ear. And so you're going to get these little anchorings. It's uh, over on the Rembrandt here, right here right here, right here, right here. All of those areas have anchoring. This is the easiest to so, yeah. Sorry, layer. This is the easiest place to see here, maybe, uh, at this scale. You can see the, the anchor of uh, the outline, the soft outline shadow edge. Uh, that gives it a real pop. So if you want a good pop of structure, then make sure you get a distinct value change and maybe even color change. Look, notice this is relatively warm. This is relatively cool. And then typical of, uh, of the Rembrandt here, typical of uh, brown school chiaroscuro artists, the darker half tone. get redder to show that blood coming to the surface. Uh, so on, 
your guy here. So mother and child. Mm -hmm. And you could have so we could group our values a little closer. We could push our half tones a little redder. So one of the rules I'll use is every time the value changes, the color, the temperature changes. So I'm going to make it a little lighter. I'm going to make it a little yellow. challenged I am with this stuff. So now every time it changes value, it changes color, it wouldn't have to be that colorful. It could be much grayer. And the thigh here. Let's see. You could still you could stay all in the cool ranges. Maybe Half tone, and then the last thing would be to anchor. So uh, let's uh, use maybe this color here. Let's, uh, so I'm on the thigh here, right in here. So notice how I'm building the core. The core shadow structurally is the uh, form not catching direct light from above, not catching direct light, and, and uh, that the core catching very little reflected light off of the sheets or whatever is around the grass or the costume or something. So the core ends up being one of the darker parts of the shadow. These deep dark pockets down in, uh, you know, in the, in the uh, crevices might get way darker. You might stylistically, as you did here, line and make it darker. But uh, structurally, this is going to be the darkest part in this open area of form. So notice like that uh, lower lip and beard area for Rembrandt, I'm accenting, anchoring, the core, and it can be very, very subtle, or it can be uh, really graphic and jump out, just depending on how the lighting situation, how realistic or stylized you want to make it. So anchoring the form. So uh, kind of uh, look at that compared to this, and you'll see that box logic is bigger, stronger statement, and uh, you get that pop. So one of the uh, soft light, we want to, as an audience, we want to be confident in you. You're taking us on a field trip. We're going into a strange new world. We walk, we visually come inside the frame, the frame of our piece. That's what frames are for. It's a window into this new world. We have to feel confident to step into a new world and feel consistent uh, in terms of the rules, unless it's an Alice in Wonderland kind of situation, we want to make sure it has certain rules. And even a crazy world like that is going to have certain rules. Uh, so we need to feel like, like you know what you're doing and and you do it consistently. So best, in, at least in the beginning, push it way in one direction or the other, into that subtle north light or into that dramatic 
Brown School direct line. All right, my friend, you take care. I hope that helped. And uh, we will uh, talk someday soon, maybe. Bye, Keith. All right. How you doing, man? I hope you're feeling safe during all this craziness. Um, let me uh, pull this up to full screen. There we go. All right. This is a lovely drawing. You did a great job. So congratulations on that. I have a couple uh, ideas. That's why we're here, of course. And you take them for what they're worth. They're not gospel. They're just thoughts to, to consider. One of the things you've done really beautifully, well, you've done several things really beautifully, but you have these really great shapes. Um, let's see here. So if we look at the shadow shape, just of this eye socket, what uh, I really like about it is that each area has its own personality. We don't stay the same for very long. The length of the facet varies. The character of the facet varies all the way along. So that's really great. Back. Okay. There we go. So anyway, that's really terrific. Now, the other thing you've done is you've really stylized. You know, it's really boxy stuff going on. And that's very cool. That's a, it's nice to see it stylized. It's not something I would do, and I love seeing things that I wouldn't do. So it's, that's, a, that's to your credit. So I would keep things more watery you're making things more mine's mine's rock yours is uh mine's uh why yours is rock kind of idea so that's great but we also want it to feel organic and rock can be organic just like water can be organic it's just a matter of complexity so life evolves it doesn't stay the same for very long. It's, some, it's uh, at least implies complexity and surprising complexity. We never quite know where it's going to evolve to. So the water can flow down the creek and they can caught in an eddy, pump around the rock or the stick, and then continue on back down, that kind of thing. So we want some of that going on structures here. So one of the things you could do is uh, do this. We'll take it in two directions. And this is not to, to try and get you to go in my direction at all. I would prefer you didn't because you've got your own thing going and it's successful. So no reason at all to switch over just because somebody put a visual piece of tracing paper over your drawing and started mucking around. But let me show you the kind of the range of possibilities and what they have in common. Let's see. Let's take that. Uh, it's not quite what I want, is it? Okay, so I'm just. Uh, moving along my uh, core shadow or your core shadow.
and bumping those anchors. The anchor is the core shadow border, or it's the um, cast shadow edge. And it uh, lets us know that things are organic, that they're not just going from light to dark, but they're changing and flowing and imperfect. And we'll get these swells and depressions. Uh, you move along and those create these uh, accents of value, either accenting lighter, as you did on your nose here, or accenting darker as you had done very nicely through most of the shadow shape and I just played right along with that. So you've got a nice accent right here, for example. I uh, picked up on that little accent there. Is it 34? I can't remember. It was almost there. So you're starting to get the accent right here. But uh, I pushed it stronger just to, to make it visible. Not that it should be that strong, but just so we can talk about it. So whenever, if I'm going right here, whenever I really push that border, it makes it imperfect and organic and complex. It makes us look smarter than we really are. And it gives us the sense that nature works in two light, uh, with two lights, the direct light that strikes the forehead here and the indirect light of the cheek, let's say, bouncing up into the eye socket. So we have a strong direct light and we have a weaker indirect light. Uh, and that, get, that again adds complexity. The core shadow, those anchoring points, the core where it doesn't catch any direct light, gets very little indirect light. Uh, that core is the uh, little accent. And then we'll get other little accents, little anchors. Um, right here where the ear separates from the neck and meets the jaw and the jaw separates from the neck. So when we push those little dark lines or dark accent marks at the collar, uh, the creasing of the, of the throat and Adam's apple against the sternocleidoid mastoid and the jaw and all that kind of stuff, when we accent those, uh, it makes it look imperfect. You can put a nice one here again. Uh, those are great throughout. So what I did then is took your clean, simple, beautiful box logic and made it more organic. So let me uh, let's see here. Accent that. So you can see now I've made it this watery design. Again, I'm not trying to ease you into that direction, but it'd be clever. I don't, uh, uh, what you're doing is fantastic. So here's, notice how it, it, it flows. It's curving one way and then curving the other. These complex curves going water down the stream idea, smoke off the butt of a cigarette, that kind of thing. The tip, I guess, of the cigarette. So that's that. Now, the other way we could go is keep this really strong uh, boxiness to it and just take that idea let's see here of imperfect evolving changes so here i can't tell when the top becomes a side i know this is side i know this is top somewhere in here 
there's a transition, but it's very imprecise. And here I know exactly where the top meets the side. It's very precise. If I wobble it in some way, either with a divot or a swelling, then you get not as precise, but quite precise where that corner is. We know in here, the top has changed into the side. In fact, we could think of that swelling as its own little corner plane, which is really what a, uh, what a core shadow is. Oops, yeah. Boom. So if we were to this thicken that up now we have a little corner plane so a little corner plane there like so so if we bring in the imprecision and the evolutionary constant ch change, constant growth of life as a uh, kind of a fundamental philosophy of shape. It wouldn't matter if we wanted to make it water or rock. So now we're simply going to Add complexity. And it's there. You could just force it See how I'm making a, a it's a much more complex pathway. Um, well, not really much more complex. It's there's subtle variations here. And um, notice how I can make those variations very structural. So now we can feel forehead and the uh, little glabella creating our, our step down from forehead to nose. And the front of the nose becoming the side of the nose and the side of the nose swelling. And we'll accent that swelling and then settling down in the interior eye nose and cheek meeting, eye, nose, and cheek meeting and not quite coming together well and it depresses and then it comes back out on the cheek proper and then moves up and moves along. So now this is a rock carver's chiseled version of that. Ton of complexity, but not at all watery. And if it is, you come back it up in one way or another. Obviously, not with this value, but just to make the point. And you can get these wonderful, uh, complex jigsaw puzzle pieces, which are which are based on very simple ideas. We're just chasing after all the variations and kicking them up, or a lot of the variations. So rather than just doing this, kind of like an oddball pair of eyeglasses or monocle. Now we, we did all the complexity that we just had done. On your nose, I did a little bit of work on that. You could take this beautiful simplicity and keep it exactly like that. Or you could decide that it's a little too stylized simple. And you can 
just vary it a little bit. So we're going to take that highlight. And it could also vary in the amount of uh, value range it has. You could swell that tip a little bit, like so. And you might decide that's completely inappropriate for what I'm trying to do here. Trying to keep it uh, hyper simple and push the simplicity and maybe even exaggerate the simplicity and not the complexity. That would be a strong choice too. And you'll see uh, like a Butero sculpture stylized in a cartoon direction uh, as well. But it could be a very simplified, stylized um, look to it. There's another artist I'm trying to think of. I can't think of the name. It's super simplified things. Uh, that would be absolutely fine. Uh, so you can take it in the opposite direction of what I'm talking about. But consider, you know, consider, say, I, this is what it looks like. I'm going to take it super simple, but still with, you know, a, maybe a little bit of complexity. Maybe it swells out just a little bit before it goes down into the brow. And that is suggestive of this other plane here. And you can make, when you pick up those little subtle variations, you come over to the other side and see if you can't find its uh, symmetrical match, its mirror image on the other side, um, and play, play with it. So anyway, a couple little ideas there. Do with them as you will. And I hope you uh, have fun doing art. That's you know, if we could take some good lesson from a, a good opportunity from all the craziness that's going on, that might be that we artists get to do more art. So I wish for you more art mads, and I wish that we get to talk in the future sometime. Bye-bye. All right. Welcome. I hope you're doing well. And forgive me if I mispronounce your name, Mingu. Uh, it's a lovely name. I'm saying it. So anyway, welcome. I hope you're doing well. And uh, let's talk about your drawing here. So I've blown it up pretty big. Uh, so I apologize for the poor resolution. But um, that's just as it is. As we might like. Okay, so I'm going to look at this leg over here. I'll tell you what you did right. Now, notice that knee structure. What we've got here is a, um, a thigh. If we look at this from the side here. A thigh that's, uh, we're going to make it real simple. It's a tube, meeting a shin and calf. It's another tube. We have a major corner there. As two parts come together, uh, and it's actually even going back this way. Looks like as two parts come together at this major corner. Now, when we rotate that around so we can look more at the front, we can see a little bit of the front here. We're going to end up getting this whole knee structure kind of dominating and intruding into the thigh over here. through the uh, ex, uh, vastus externus, the outside quadricep muscle. And that's going to separate from this hamstring group that's underneath in here. So we have that kind of uh, stepping down there. And we'll see that right here. So this top in here is at least here. The kneecap's a little lower. It's in here. And the common uh, patellum tendon, which comes down and attaches to the shin, is in here. So we want that. Now, when you've got structures that are in deep perspective and are overlapping each other, the farther you can push that, that uh, 
near structure inside the far structure, the deeper the perspective and the better sense of, of uh, structure you have, which is form and position. Ideally, you actually get the structure interlocking, not just overlapping. This is like a snowman, or it's like a uh, lunar or solar eclipse, where the objects may not even touch at all, even though they have visually have overlapped each other. Better is more like a key lock wrench around a nut to turn that nut on the, the car engine or like a key going into a lock that kind of thing uh, and we have then in an inner lock a structure breaking inside inserting or interlocking inside another structure and the difference between an overlap in an interlock, is an interlock has so the dramatic pause here. An interlock has some of the sides and the end of the structure. Switch that up. Okay, you get the idea. Some of the sides and the end side, the side and end of this tube breaking into the ball there. And that's what we have here. We want this way up in. So that's that shin and calf. Let's just do it like this. And we could pretend that the knee structure is its own little structure would be one way to do it. And the calf and shin The third structure. So we have one, two, three, one, two, three. This whole knee structure creates a corner. And that for us, as we look at it, is more or less the front plane. Front plane and then bottom plane, bottom plane, and then top plane, top plane. Now, if we can get that interlocking structure, not just the front structure here, but a whole mass in deep perspective inserting into another structure that's going to be the best and you did it right here and you just need to take it a little farther here now we don't need that to completely um let's see if this works here i'm doing that part's working how do my automatic settings aren't working for some reason i don't know how to fix them so here's the egg behind, it's a particular oblong egg, right here, and here is my tube, tube inserting into the egg. Here's the front of that tube, front of that tube. So we get that nice interlock. So you just need to add a little bit here to get that. Now on this leg, so the reason I spent so much time on this one, on this leg we're not getting any of those structural hints that we're getting that you're doing such a nice job showing us over here. So we've got this lovely overlap. We have the change here. We have this coming in here a little bit. I made it uh, pop in a little bit more, but you've got a lot of uh, a lot of hints. So you get the little overlap right there. So we just wanted to strengthen that a little or a lot more. It could be just that much. But we yeah, have this really lovely line there, and it can be a lot of line. Quality. 
be stylized. And, and most of what you're doing here, the core shadows and such, they're stylized. Nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, there's a lot right with that. So that's okay. You just need to give us some uh, visual clues that this is not a leg that's sitting flat in, uh, in position in the picture plane. It's in a deep, dramatic, foreshortened perspective doing this, something like this. So we need to somehow pick up on that. So we would want to, there'd be a lot of ways we could do it. We can overlap here. Just that much, dot, dot, dot. By having that, that is suggesting we have a structure in here, and then look at here, you've got it there beautifully, like so. And so we're feeling this up and over quality really nicely. So we want to, we want to make that uh, play longer. Now let me just finish off that contour. And so we could open that up a little bit. Again, a little overlap or not either way, but every little bit helps. Let's just take it away for a second. And see this shadow right here, this one right here. We want to play that up maybe a little bit as well. Because I've blown up the image, it's uh, not really makes a big deal out of those tools. You could even give it a little hitch. I'm going to fatten up that core shadow. Uh, that's a little more realistic, uh, the way I fattened up as opposed to even a stylized line. That's not the stylization, as I said earlier, is not a problem. I'm just doing that so it's easier to see. So um, I'm a fan of stylized realism, and if realists get too uh, kind of um, stiff, and fussy about getting things exactly right. I like to see things vary a little bit. So if we were to get that, let me take this out of here. Open stretch a minute. If I could just show the top of that kneecap rather than the bottom, notice what happened here. You emphasized the, um, the bottom of the kneecap. I'm emphasizing the top of the kneecap. So I'm going to get rid of that bottom. So think of it as a story. If you've got a limited, say it's a little children's book, you have a real limited amount. And you got to show that that uh, dog that's chasing the cat, or that dog's a mean guy, and the cat's a nice guy. So you can't, it's a children's book, it's only eight pages or whatever it is. You don't have time to talk about all the times a dog happens to be nice or at least not mean. You got to go right to the mean behavior to establish that that's the villain of the story, that's the bad guy. Can't have Darth Vader showing up and immediately given all the uh, rebellion leaders hugs. He's got to come and start shooting people and being mean to people and being a bully even to his own people. So we know this is a bad guy. Later, 
in a couple move, more movies, maybe we'll show that he's actually not quite so bad. But in the beginning, we've got to establish the character. Same way in your artwork. In the beginning, establish what's most important. In this case, I'm arguing, whoops, I didn't, oops, I wanted it. In this case, I'm arguing that this is the most important thing structurally to show that movement out. So I'm going to play out all the things that reinforce this idea, this up and over, which is specifically detail that's higher in the middle and detail that's lower on the sides. Detail that is higher in the middle, higher at or near the middle, and lower Over on the sides. And then we start to get that idea. Okay, and we need to do that all the way through with our overlaps. That's a terrific overlap. That's not so good. That's not so good because these are suggesting this idea. So we want to go all, all the way through and preferably begin the drawing by reinforcing those three-dimensional ends. The sides are two-dimensional, up and down. That doesn't give us any structure. It's the ends, E and D ends. They give us the three-dimensional structural quality. And in this case, we're underneath this fellow right here. So the detail gets higher in the center, at or near the center gets lower at or near the sides consistently. And then once you've established that, you can do a few things that may go against that. But at fir uh, first, reinforce it. Okay? So that's your tip for the day. I hope it helps. I hope you keep drawing. That's one of the uh, few nice things about all the pain that's going on around the world is at least we artists can produce some beautiful works or practice getting more beautiful. And this is the process of being both all of your paintings you had three paintings there as well as several drawings and she they were just gorgeous just really nice work so these are just little points to work on but in any case for we artists we're lucky because we can spend a little bit of each day and maybe a lot of each day in quarantine time producing beautiful things to put out in the world and getting better and better at it with all that practice so i hope the tip helped I hope you stay safe, and I hope someday we get to talk in person. All right. Welcome, Robin. I hope you're doing well with our crazy things going on and staying safe and feeling safe. Uh, beautiful work. Really a lovely piece here. Uh, and I love kind of lost and found. So uh, let's see what we have here. Is it Um, like losing the tip of the nose there is great. And uh, the base of the tree and having more uh, richer, more dramatic detail in the curls here and more lost and impressionistic and, uh, and uh, misty, uh, magical over here. And the soft edges here. You're doing a nice job, and it fits well, obviously, with the subject matter. And the, just lovely little accents, just a few little accents of leaves and flowers and stems and stuff. It's all really nicely done. So you've established a world where things change subtly but quickly. We go from uh, quite a bit of detail to the, not very much detail. We go from uh, uh, somewhat harder edges, somewhat harder edges, to softer edges and lost edges. Uh, same down here, same here, harder edge, softer edge, hard, soft, kind of lost. So we have this transition and it, and it tends to, not always, but it tends to be the harder edges are closer to us, and the stronger contrast is closer to us. And that's very smart. 
as well as size wise things that are closer to us uh, for the most part are bigger and as they get farther from us they get smaller uh, also very smart so let's push that just a little bit farther um for example let's see here i'm going to take oh, i'm going to take this color let's say And uh, notice how you have a highlight here on the forehead, and then it drops off. Now, let me, you have a highlight right there. It makes sense to do use white, huh? And that creates this corner, right? In fact, it creates a couple corners. So, and every time you have this highlight flaring or a little flare of light or half tone, it's going to suggest corners. And every time you have an accent that's a darker value, whether it's a local color change or a, a structural change, it's going to have a corner. So if we keep in mind that this is a misty, magical world, let's just call it, and things get crisper and bigger and sharper in focus in general, give or take the material and such, uh, as they're closer to us and just the opposite, softer, less distinct, closer in value, and smaller as they get farther from us. If we take that, then we can play that big picture, but we can also play it within the, uh, the little bits and pieces of the piece. So now let's go back. Let's pick this and this and this. And this. And notice uh, I called out that highlight on the forehead here. We have a lighter half tone here. If we uh, let's see here, if we let that brow ridge be a little bit right here is where I worked, be a little bit uh, less accented. This ridge here over the eyebrow is more accented. The other is less. Okay. So here it's lighter and about the same here. I've mucked around with it a little bit, but about the same. In fact, let's just do that. That's what it was. By knocking that down, this side will be stronger, it'll have more volume, more box logic, more bang for the buck. This will be less distinct. It'll feel like it's starting to move back into, uh, into this misty magical world as we talked about down here. So we could do that in all these areas on the cheek. On the side of the mouth, you can even play out. I'll push this farther. You can either even destroy some of the structure in an area and with this. Uh, beautiful subtle face that you've done it did take some uh, finesse but anyway you can knock it back down there um, see how strong those shapes are 
and by making them strong, they really jump out and appear closer to us than this side over here. So, and as I've kind of mucked up some things a little bit by simplifying it just at a glance without correcting the drawing and the rendering, this side, this near side of the cheek has more structure and more architecture to it. And this side is flatter and less distinct. And you can do the same thing with the uh, um, with all the uh, edges and everything too. And you could uh, start to soften that edge and make it an edge. You could even make it a lost edge if you wanted to. So all the way through, you can push things down. And sometimes you'll want to do that. Sometimes you won't. So I'm going to go into the jaw here. And just by pushing that neck back, it thrusts the head forward more. And we'll thrust the, uh, keep the breast, uh, chest area less pushed back. If we emphasize the bottom of the uh, jaw and chin there, again, that's going to separate, that's going to make the face pop forward and the neck, of course, is, is dropped back again. We could even push the um, chin forward a little bit. Let's see what does that one I want? Maybe so. And that we're doing that, even though now that competes a little bit with the mouth and the cheek, and such up here, uh, but. Um, it separates again. It gives that a pop and it pushes this neck back in space farther. So it's going to come out farther. So anyway, go towards the end of your piece, your painting, your drawing, go through and see if you can take the big logic of the piece and apply it to the, the smaller architecture of the piece. You did it here actually really nicely in the nostrils. This nostril has a darker accent than this nostril, and that helps this side to pop forward, come towards us, and this other side to diminish, and we could push that a little bit farther over. Try and do that just a touch. So that nostril fits away. Now the structure of the of the underside of the nose suffers a little bit. Doesn't have quite the structure of nostrils into septum that split uh, between the nostrils and the come off the ball of the nose. But it uh, makes again this side this side of the face pop out, and this side diminishes. And sometimes you just need an area to to jump out. Maybe there's a magical earring on, on the, over here that's going to be part of the story of this the fantasy. And so we'd make that jump out more. It's a mismatch earring and this is the important earring and uh, this is the uh, fake less important earring. And so we make them both strong, but we make this a little stronger as a setup for later on. This is going to be the means to a happy ending, or whatever. So sometimes we'll break the rules for some storytelling reason, aesthetic reason, gut instinct. Uh, but overall, if we play up more structure, more contrast on one side, bigger uh, areas, more refined detail, or greater 
contrast and detail, all those kind of things, hard edges, um, color, you could push more uh, color range, warm, more warm and cools on one side, let it be more muted on the other. All those things will help to push and pull the dynamics of the piece and create a subtler or more nuanced, more, uh, more complex um, piece of work. So anyway, I hope that helped and I hope you stay safe and maybe we can talk and even meet in person sometime. I like that.